So welcome this afternoon. Um, I would now like to introduce uh, my fellow panel members. Um, we've got Rabi Luadi, who's from Huawei Technologies. Um, I'll get them to introduce themselves a bit more when they get here. I've got Malcolm Thomas, who's from Parsons Brinkerhoff. Um, I've got Mohammed Monterazzi um, from Tirana Urban and Suburban Railway Company. Um, and I've got Alan Polinski from Aratape in France. Just welcome them to the stage, please. Right, so if we start from my left, and to just one minute to introduce yourselves so that you know who you're actually hearing from this, this afternoon and, and, and the sort of subjects that we can talk about. I'm Dr. Montazeri from Tehran Metro. I'm a university teacher and at the same time deputy managing director of Tehran Metro. I'll be happy to talk about Tehran Metro and the experiences we have in that field. My name is Alan Polonsky. I'm representing RATP Dev. RATP Dev is a subsidiary of RATP, the Paris operator. And I'm in charge of the uh, business development of uh, RATP Dev worldwide. Okay, thank you. Good afternoon. I'm Malcolm Thomas of Parsons Brinkerhoff. I'm head of discipline for systems engineering for Umina. And I'm currently working on various rail projects in the UK, including High Speed 2. And uh, I'm Rabi Wadi, uh, Head of Business Development for the MENA region for Huawei Technologies, ICT provider. Thank you very much. Right. Um, before, I, uh, a couple of my, my colleagues have got a few words and, and questions to start stimulating this. Um, but just an introduction. I think in this room, we've got expertise from around the world. Uh, and this morning, I attempted to, well, I talked about London Underground, how it's celebrating its 150th anniversary this year, and being the first underground realm in the world. Since then, lots of systems have been built. Uh, and in my estimation, at a, a quick look on, on the internet, there are around 190 metro systems around the world. Ranging in length, uh, the shortest I found was 3.8 kilometers long in Sicily, up to 442 kilometers, which is Beijing. Now, that became only the longest system overtaking London beginning this year on the 3rd of January. So that is now the longest system. Uh, and I think what I found out in Beijing, typical ridership of 5.97 million. So just under 6 million passengers a day ride the, on the metro in Beijing. If we look more further in, into the systems, of those 190, I think I estimated around 35 of them have driverless systems like, like the metro in Dubai here. And 46 of them, so it's more than the driverless systems, have platform screen doors. So if you look at those are sort of later technologies coming on. Not many of the metros run 24 seven, in other words, continuously. Most um, close overnight for, for maintenance. Um, for instance, London last week, London Underground announced that it run one hour later on a Friday and a Saturday. Um, people are saying, why not overnight? But it's an old system that needs maintenance. I also talked this morning about on Crossrail, we've used the Strapline World Class Railway, and it's been used some time. Um, and the theme of this, this session conference is revolutionising commuter travel for the Middle East. So, what Maybe you can think this afternoon what you think in the Middle East would actually be seen to be a world-class um, railway, world-class commuter, world-class metro, world-class high speed. So in our discussions, I think it's worth touching on subjects such as accessibility, how accessible the systems are to different type of customers, hours of operation, customer information, and that's from home right through journey to, to, to the beyond destination hours of operation, and there is balancing the customer needs versus the operator needs, value for money, how much revenue risk there is, how, what the fares would be. And how you look at a system, when you look at a, a city, do you have competing systems that are trying to compete with each other commercially, or is it part of an integrated network? Sponsorship is another thing that we can think about. So there's some thoughts there that I have that hopefully we can get our discussion going. Um, I do want to make this interactive, but I think firstly, Alan, you've got 
a few few thoughts to, to try and kick us off with. Yeah, I wanted to to develop a few ideas, a few examples um, to see how you can increase ridership. But the, actually, everywhere in the world, we believe that the two main challenges are first how to increase the offering in a short time frame in already congested cities where the, uh, uh, the availability of space is, is limited. So this is one first challenge. The second uh, being how to increase the quality of service to convince people to use the public transportation system and leave their car. So these are the main, main elements, and I think during our discussion we'll, uh, we'll go more into that. I'll maybe present two of those ideas. Um, you have the next one? Okay. So basically, if you look uh, more precisely, first you need to improve uh, the public transport suffering, that's, that's clear and then make really the access to uh, the network easier of which uh, providing a real-time information. And then I, I think also to, to convince even more people to use uh, the public transportation system. I think tramways is a very good example and a way of doing it, just like Dubai is doing it right now. Uh, one point is once, of course, if you want to develop offering, uh, you can build new lines clearly. But once it's congested, when you are, once you are at the limits of your capacity, what can you do? You may try to reduce the headway. You may try to make your system more flexible. But at some point, you really arrive on the limits. And what we try to do in Paris is uh, to automate a line which is a uh, line wine in, uh, in Paris, which is uh, the most, um, the busiest line. And automating it without interrupting the service, uh, we managed to increase the capacity by 6%, reduce the headway, and of course gain on flexibility, being less dependent on uh, uh, the availability of staff. And of course there is a, um, an impact in terms of savings because through that you can use uh, less rolling stock and of course staff cost. It was a major challenge because you have to imagine that this line, this is the cross line, um, it's I mean, not easy to see this, this east-west uh, line uh, across Paris um, with 50,000 uh, PPHPD and this line cannot be interrupted so to do so uh, you really needed in the meantime to install uh, platform screen doors, install new rolling stock, change fully the system, and of course, uh, retrain people. I will st stop like this to make it more interactive, but I'll, maybe I'll, I'll be developing uh, other ideas uh, later. Okay? okay? Thank you very much, Alan. Um, Malcolm, would you like to give us some thoughts, some questions to provoke us? Yeah, I think... Um what we've found in operating or looking at developing ra uh, new railways operating at very high capacities um, with you know, high numbers of trains per hour, then managing the passenger flow is absolutely imperative. Um, one of the projects that I've been working on is the Thameslink program in, in London, where we're looking at putting 24 trains per hour through the core in the central London. Uh, that leads us to have dwell times of less than a minute um, and, and getting passengers on and off trains and away from the platforms and out to the street or onto the other modes of transport they're using is critical in doing that. Otherwise, you just don't achieve the throughput. Um, so designing the platform train interface and all the information systems that go around that um, right back to you know, when they get out of bed in the morning and they want to travel. You know, when should they get there? How do we manage the flow of passengers from whatever mode of transport they're on, through the stations, down to the platforms, onto the trains and away? And so giving that integrated information both on the trains and in the stations is absolutely key. Otherwise, you, you don't achieve. Um, you can 
have all these aspirations, but you just won't achieve without actually making the passenger's life as stressless as possible. Okay. Ravi, you've got some ideas to, to put into uh, our discussion? Yes, of course. Uh, particularly as an ICT provider, Huawei is uh, helping the railway operators to make the metro or the train more attractive. And that's one of the questions raised by RATP here. Basically, we have to make the metro more accessible, more attractive than the people who are used to take their car to travel, to commute every day to work, will leave the car and will better take the metro. But the metro should be more uh, convenient. Uh, they should, the people should be able to do something in the metro that they can't do when they uh, travel by car and when they drive. So, except listening to the radio, when they are driving, they can't do anything. If uh, in the metro you provide uh, entertainment or even uh, internet access, then the people, they will find it more, uh, more fun. And they might prefer every morning just to be able to use their smartphone and to go on their favorite internet website or to go on Facebook, they will prefer to take the metro and they prefer then, even if they spend maybe a little bit more time to commute by metro, they said, okay, I prefer because I will be more relaxed, I will look uh, on my uh, smartphone during all my journey, I can do many things. And, and that's where we come, actually, where we come from Huawei. We provide ICT solutions for a metro operator to come on the top of the uh, infrastructure such as the rolling stock, we complete this offer with our ICT solution to make the metro more attractive. Okay, thank you. Try to provide an example of exactly what, what you said. If this works, can we come back to the presentation? Um, so basically, I think we'll come back. Um, what is important is that to, so that people really get onto the uh, the metro, um, they must be sure. Yes, thank you. <laughs> they must be sure that uh, the service will be safe, the service will be reliable, uh, the, and uh, the stations will be clean. This is. This is the performance you talked about, Mike, this morning, and this is the basic. This must, this is, this must be absolutely uh, guaranteed. But on top of that, so that people really access to the uh, the system, you make make you must make sure that the um, interface between the city and the the system is as smooth as possible, and that's why we are developing uh, stations which are not only places where you get onto the system, but where you can shop, where you can, uh, where, where, where some services are being uh, provided, um, and where you can also have an easy access from one system to another, say soft modes like uh, bicycles, of course, but for also to, to, uh, to interchange easily uh, to the tram or to the bus. So all this must be as smooth as possible, as easy as possible. Um, and of course, um, personnel must be here to attend, to help, and must be around the customer. This has been also been developed this morning. And to make it even more easy, uh, it is also extremely important to have a pass, let's say like for instance, a Navigo pass, a contactless pass in Paris, uh, which uh, enables you to use the whole network without uh, having to change uh, your, your ticket. And th this can be even uh, be improved, uh, providing um, ticketless uh, on smartphones or buying your tickets on, uh, on ATM machines. So this, this, this process of accessing one to one uh, network to another and using this, the, the network must be as smooth as possible. Let's give a ex last example. The real-time information people must also be able to choose at every moment the uh, way of transport they want to use. And at, at moment T, look at every 
alternative they have, their car, a train, a bus, a metro. And this is possible in Paris because the system is very dense. Um, and choose the best one. And this, um, this is only made possible when you get real-time information on your iPhone, or smartphone, um, or on every bus station or on every station. So okay, just, uh, thank you. Mohamed, do you have anything you wish to add to our discussion? Well, yeah. I think it's on already. <laughs> yes. Yeah, we have our metro line active for the last 15 years. And uh, it has been so successful that we could carry 5 billion passengers for the last 15 years. We started with 50,000 passengers a day. Now it's 3 million a day with yeah. five lines, 140 kilometers. So it shows that this is, the system has been quite successful because we are offering, first of all, a cheap system. The ticket price is 15 US cents per passenger, which is quite cheap. And it's very safe and it's very fast. The statistics we collected from uh, passengers, in average, they indicated that they are saving time 25 minutes per trip. So they are all advantages of having this system active and people are quite happy with it. To be honest with you, we have so many passengers that we cannot answer them now. So we have to ask them not to come to our stations because it's so crowded. And our headway is now four minutes because we don't have much train. We are, we have now, we are not supplying the trains and we are planning to have the headway of two minutes. With this number of lines we have, with this 140 kilometer we have, if we increase, if we decrease our headway, I'm sure we will be having five million passengers a day for sure. There are so many reasons for that, and I think the people are quite happy with it. We have got, of course, the mobile system which is working there. We have got our ticketing system, automatic ticketing system. We have now connected our automatic collection system with our bus systems and trying to have it with our taxi systems. And we think the more we connect the whole transportation mode together, we can attract more people in the easiest and better way. But you say you can attract more people where it seems like you probably haven't got the capacity at the moment, so... Yeah, we have it. Yeah. It's interesting, you talk about ticketing, uh, and, and Alan talked about integrated ticketing as well. In London, we've had Oyster, whew, probably 10 years plus, uh, and we're now moving on to wave and pay, so using bank cards rather than... Um, a ticket, when you look at actually a ticket office, it's a bit like a bureau de change when you're changing your cash into miles to travel on the system. So if we can remove the need to actually do that change and you can just use your bank card and that will then deduct the fare from you, then it will improve the efficiency because we won't need ticket offices, we won't need the ticketing equipment, we won't necessarily need the staff to actually sell the ticket. So there's some thoughts there. Um, anything? You want yes, to say? Absolutely. There is something important that we have also to emphasize is the uh, passenger satisfaction, how to make them happy for sure by providing uh, some capabilities that like uh, having uh, internet access, which is a matter of satisfaction to attract the customers, but also passenger information. As we mentioned, this is very important. Passenger information must be available. Uh, the people should not wait, or if they wait, they should know how long they are going to wait for the next train. So having these information also is quite critical. And uh, the other critical part is the safety. What will uh, convince the drivers to change to the metro? Maybe it's the safety. And uh, for that, it's safer to travel by metro rather than traveling by car. However, the safety system and the, all the mechanism um, about the security inside the metro has to be put in place. All that need also a strong ICT capabilities, transmission systems uh, on which the uh, CBTC signaling will rely. Uh, for the passenger information system, of course, you need a uh, data communication uh, network uh, behind to provide all these data on the passenger information system screens. And all that also uh, is quite important to increase the passenger satisfaction. And again, this is where Huawei comes from by providing its ICT solutions. Okay, thank you. Uh, I know in London, one of the things that has been said is that our customers know more about the system than our staff do because they've got handheld devices. We've now got Wi-Fi on over 100 stations. 
uh, on the underground. Um, and so you've got to make sure that the customers um, are kept informed, but actually the staff are trying to keep them one step ahead. Okay, anything? We've, we've touched on improving capacity without new infrastructure, and that was about automation. Uh, I know in London we've had that, uh, one of the lines, the Jubilee line, um, by improving automation has, has got the capacity up, so much so we're having to buy some more trains um, to meet to the uh, 30 trains an hour plus timetable. Um, tramways was talked around, um, and the use of tramways, to getting people off cars, and the relationship of tramways to metros is, is something that I think is worth exploring. Um, we talked about managing passenger flows, the full information from getting out of bed to knowing the decision making, getting through stations. A lot of sort of issues coming out there. Um, we've got a few, quite a few minutes if, if really to throw it open to the floor. So I don't know, Frey, the microphone. So as with all these things, it's useful if you can use the microphone so we can hear and your fellow... Uh, colleagues can hear, and it's also good if you can say who you are and where you come from, because that gives us a bit of context. Thank you. Uh, my name is Amit Doshi. I'm from W. Sadkins. Uh, interesting session. Uh, got a, another sort of point of view, slightly different. When we talk about Middle East context, uh, where the petrol is cheap, uh, environment is slightly different, where people may not be willing to walk more than five, seven minutes. Uh, how important is the role of feeder bus network? Because you can't bring rail, obviously, to the doorsteps of all the homes. So, I mean, when, when trying to increase the ridership or trying to bring more people on train, uh, how, how do you think uh, buses will play a, a role? So the question there is, we've talked about metros, but how can we use buses to feed in to get people off, out of cars onto buses to feed into the metro. Yeah? Absolutely, yeah. Okay, well, so. I, yeah, if you don't mind. Well, we all believe that the metro should act as a backbone of the transportation system. And that's what we are applying now. We cannot change these stations in metro. They are all fixed. We cannot change the route of the metro. It's all fixed. What we have done, and we have been quite successful, we deleted all bus lines which were running parallel to metro lines and we changed them to be, um, to collect the passengers from all around areas and to bring them to metro stations. So we have used the capacity of the metro in conjunction with the capacity of the buses and we have been quite successful in combining this system and since we are using the same ticketing system for bus and for metro line, the system is quite working well for us. So in where you are, Mohammed, is, is the transit authority in charge of responsible for both buses and, and metro? We are, we are both, we have got two different companies, bus company and metro company, but they are controlled by Tehran municipality, so the, the guy who is sitting up is controlling both of us, so we, we have to work together. And it's the same for the taxi company, we, that, which means it's controlled by the municipality, so we have to work together in a close relation, and there is no parallel or something like that. So there we're seeing the advantage of an integrated system that's actually planned. Now, of course, other world cities will have a, city, a system where it's competition. The metro is one company, the buses are another. Okay. The, in London, so the buses are privatised, private sector operators, of course, don't necessarily want to feed into the metro station. So how do we, not for necessarily yourself, but any of my colleagues' ideas about how to deal with that? Of course, at the beginning, it's a political decision. and It makes definitely sense to integrate uh, all modes of transport, then you can share in different, uh, among different operators or not. That's, uh, not. that's an option. But definitely you need to have a view on all modes and be sure that they complement one another. And basically bus uh, complement a tram line for in smaller cities or a metro or metro lines and bring passengers. Uh, Name another example, like uh, we run the GO train, which is an um, intercity train between Johannesburg and Pretoria in South Africa. And the authority uh, of Gauteng, their province in South Africa, wanted us also to run the feeder buses, feeding all stations along, uh, along the way. And that's a way to be sure um, 
that people can access from home to, uh, to the system. And as also another way, and that's here we're more in politics, uh, to be sure that the bus um, operators do not compete with the new, or with a new, um, in, in this case, train line. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so at the end, it is really win-win. Uh, but you really need to combine it, and if uh, very often you have buses before a tram line or even a metro line, and you have to align interests this uh, for uh, for the uh, or to, to improve actually the, the level of service. Okay, thank you. I think what Rabbi you said earlier um, about metro also applies to buses is that people, when they're driving, it's downtime; they can't do anything. But if they're on the bus or on the metro and they've got Wi-Fi access or, or mobile 3G, 4G technology, they can actually use that time productively or they can use social networking. Yeah? Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. And uh, the challenge here is to provide this inside the bus or the metro. And how to convey this uh, signal that is coming from outside, or the Wi-Fi or yeah. even more the 4G, here, that's the challenge. So, okay. uh, of course, uh, now uh, with uh, the uh, innovative ICT technology, and I will talk about it a little bit later, you will see, uh, we provide now some uh, new uh, equipment, tools, to be able to propagate the signal. So, recently, for example, in France, RATP has opened the Wi-Fi service inside the uh, metro stations. It has been done thanks to some uh, specific solution. And this is basically the innovations uh, that happens over the last years that allow us to do that. And the more okay. we progress in this innovative telecommunication solution, the better uh, the transportation will be. And uh, we think that there is a, a convergence between the, 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 the two worlds, the telecommunication IT, ICT world and the transportation world in order to make the customer more happy. That's okay. the point. Thank you. Right, we have another question. Hi, hello. My name is Milda. I'm from Aerial News. I have a question to Mr. Montezeri. Uh, the Wikipedia tells me Sorry, that... Sorry, can you... Yes, can you hear me? A bit, bit louder. Okay. Um, Wikipedia tells me that the Tehran uh, Line 3 is planned to be extended to the airport. Is that true? And if yes, what, what stage the plans are? The line to the airport, yeah? Line to the airport, line three. Well, line three is 35 kilometer, and uh, we are opening it in different phases. The first one is started now with two stations, seven kilometer. The second phase is the southern part, the length of 12 kilometer, and at the end it goes to the airport, to international airport, in two years, time. well, in, in, in less than a year. Okay, thank you. Right, that was a very specific question. And there must be more questions towards the back. If you can speak up, because we've, we're fighting some sound outside up here. Okay, can you hear me now? Yes. Uh, my name is uh, Tayyip Makadmi. I'm uh, responsible for uh, ATC signaling in uh, rail agency RTA. Um, uh, what you showed us today, yeah, it's interesting. That's uh, basically what is the what has been done to attract people, to motivate them to use the public uh, transportation system. Um, however, did you have any experience of, uh, for example, having uh, surveys to your own customers, uh, where you tell them what would you like to see, that will encourage you to use the system if you're not really uh, a frequent user or something like this. And do you have any, any results, uh, any statistics? Uh, it's always better to get all ideas from the whole world rather than sitting ourselves and think about this. Okay. Did you have such an experience? So it's, it's a question about what factors do customers appreciate to get them onto the system? And yeah. is there an, any f statistics to go with that? Yeah, actually, more specifically, did you make like surveys? Did you, do you know exactly what people are yeah, looking for? Yeah. So what surveys uh, do we yes, actually undertake? Yes. Okay. Yeah, pa in Paris. W one idea is around tramways. Definitely, when you make a survey on the different modes, in Paris, the area, so, so suburban train, metro, bus, 
and tramways which have been redeveloped over the last uh, 15 years. They had disappeared and now there is a new modern tramways like you're doing now in Dubai. And we clearly see that the satisfaction level of customers to this new way of transport, or renew way, which is tramway, are extremely high, much higher than the others, because it is environmentally friendly, it is quiet, it is integrated into the city. I mean, it's, the access is simple, um, and it is a way of uh, crossing the city, which is clearly more pleasant than all the other ones. Okay. Um, so this, this is what we see, and this around this, and we do this in Paris, uh, it's done everywhere else in, in Europe, and uh, now more and more elsewhere. Um, this is really a way to rethink a city and really convince people to leave their cars and uh, really move in another way inside the city. So it is a very powerful um, instrument to, uh, okay. to promote um, public transportation. Mohamed, do you have anything in Tehran about customer surveys? Yeah, I talk. I think just talk, they're controlling you from the back. Well, I told you that we did once and, and they were all happy about it. We, of course, we did it for Tehran Metro. And they, they all indica indicated that the, the average saving time is 25 minutes, so, so they, they are quite happy with it. Uh, and, and I can give you another example of uh, the, the, the problem of graffiti. We had it and we have it in buses, but we don't have it in none of the cars of, me of metro cars. It shows that the people are so happy with it, yeah. they even themselves keep it clean. Good. And, and, right. and, and it shows that they are happy with the system. So the self-cleaning regime. So. <laughs> Not completely, but, but yeah. at, at least we don't see any damages. Then. Don't give your customers brooms to clean <laughs> it, no. Uh, I, I know in London, on a more serious point, that yes, we have a number of surveys. We have customer satisfaction, which we employ independent researchers. We have mystery shopper surveys, uh, and we have national passenger surveys. Uh, and for instance, customer satisfaction, there are over 25 different points that are um, customers are asked for about the, the traditional things like performance, reliability, it talks about cleanliness of trains, cleanliness of stations, uh, visibility of staff on trains, on platforms. Uh, it looks at graffiti. Uh, I know that, for instance, on London Overground, we've had a policy of cleaning graffiti, which has been a major problem in London. We have a policy of cleaning it off within 24 hours. Um, the psychology says the graffiti artists, they want to display their wares. So if you keep cleaning off, they'll stop and they'll go away, which they have done. And we found since doing that, the customer satisfaction has gone up 10 percentage points in terms of the feeling and the, visit, the security on the railway because of that. So yeah, we do have a lot of customer satisfactions and uh, we are reported nationally on that. Okay, um, we're running out of time, but if there's any more questions and that anyone has. We really do have time for just one more if there is, or I'll draw a line on it in that case. Right, well that was a, great, a canter around a few, few issues. Um, hopefully you found that, that useful. We've looked at about capacity, improving capacity without new infrastructure, using automation. We've touched a bit on passenger information, managing customers around. I think the general feeling we've got is we're finding more and more customers are coming onto our systems and how can we manage them better without huge investments in new infrastructure. And that's where the use of technology um, appropriately applied um, can really provide benefits. So, I think that's it for this session. I'd like to thank my, my colleagues uh, for answering the questions and, and giving some of their viewpoints. Thank you very much. <laughs>